All right, I'd like to do a little reflecting on uh, what we've just learned in Chapter 15, the cultural transformations, with the focus on religion and science. Now, remember I explained to you guys that um, several of the world's religions that we've studied, like Islam and Christianity, Hinduism, um, they're all viewed through a, um, a prism of change in the early modern period. Now, there are other cultural transformations, like the Scientific Revolution, of course, that also emerged during this time period. Uh, the Protestant Reformation greatly diversified the practice and expression of Christianity. Um, the political and the theological effects of the Re Reformation can often be compared to other religious divisions um, that we've studied, like the Great Schism in the Catholic Church in the 11th, uh, 11th century, the Sunni and the Shia split in Islam, and even the separation of Buddhism into Theravada and Mahayana practices. So, um, but I'd also like to put an emphasis on the uh, syncretic forms of religion that we um, studied about in Section 2, um, which was the persistence and change in Afro-Asian cultural traditions. Um... You know, remember that opening image um, we talked about? It's just a, another adaptation of Christianity within um, what was previously Aztec, Aztec Mexico. And adaptations of Christianity and African religions occurred in the Americas, while a blend of Islam and Hindu, Hinduism emerged um, with the growth of Sikhism in northern India. Now, Islam, which was first introduced in, I believe it was chapter 9, um, has been mentioned in nearly every chapter since. Um, but And it also receives attention in this chapter. Now, the practices of Islam continue to spread into increasingly diverse settings in Asia and Africa and transformed as well by some of the renewal movements that we learned about in section 2, like the Wahhabism in Arabia. Um, which had a great deal of influence on modern Saudi Arabia and the general population's understanding of Islam, uh, even into the 21st century. Um, but we also learned about the scientific revolution that's examined in this chapter, um, and we did it through a world history perspective. So instead of investigating just the evolution of specific discoveries or schools of thought in Europe, um, we specifically looked at the European cultural transformations in a larger global picture. And so um, I believe this, this book and this content um, really prompts you guys to ask why the breakthrough of the scientific, scientific revolution occurred first in Europe during this period as opposed to anywhere else. And so that brings us to the early modern ideas of today. Ideas shape people's mental or cultural worlds and influence behavior, and they always have. And with the development of early modern ideas, you know, it took place in an environment of great cultural borrowing. Um, borrowing was selective, sometimes called or uh, caused serious conflict. Um, and foreign ideas and practices were often domesticated or they no longer were foreign, but became um, domestic. So just this, some things to think about when it comes to cultural borrowing uh, and its hazards. Hmm. Okay, sorry about that. I got the images fixed here. Okay, this is visual source number one, the interior of a Dutch Reformed church. So what obvious differences do you notice between, for example, this church and the church of document, or not document, but visual source number two, which is a Catholic Baroque style uh, church in Austria? Well, the Catholic church is definitely more ornate um, than the Protestant church. Uh, contains statues and paintings, and the layout of the two churches is very different. Um, the high altar in the uh, Catholic church is like a focal point, while the pulpit 
at the central crossing of the Protestant church um, is its focal point. Of course, the lavish interior of the Catholic church may have a, you know, appealed to the senses, uh, provoking an emotional response, uh, you know, of awe and grandeur towards God. But the more um, sparsely de decorated Protestant church may have promoted a more inward or quiet reflection on God. And so it just, it could have reminded parishioners that they should rely only on God's grace rather than worldly objects. <clears throat> Let's see. How might Protestant and Catholics have reacted upon entering each other's churches? Well, both would have noticed immediately the differences in decor and the layout of the churches. They might have noticed the presence or lack of holy intercessors and the relative separation or lack of separation between the laity and the clergy. Um, and keep in mind that visual source one is a painting, right? This is not, okay? This is a painting. So why do you think the artist showed the people disproportionately small? Well, probably did so for aesthetic effect, um, to allow the building to be the center of attention and the people are placed into the background. Um, and there's no obvious religious reason, reasons for depicting the people disproportionately small um, because the congregation is worshiping rather than the church itself. Um, that was, you know, what was made the space holy. Okay, this is visual source number three, cultural blending in Andean Christianity. Andean, A-N-D-E-A-N. So what is Mary's relationship to the heavenly beings standing over her? God the Father on the right. The dove, symbolizing probably the Holy Spirit. And Jesus to the left. As well as even to the miners that are working in the mountain. What is the significance of the crown on her head and her outstretched arms? Well, the heavenly beings standing above Mary probably illustrate that she is the one chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus, right? And even the presence of the minor show that she is a compassionate protector and in, <clears throat> intercessor on their behalf with Jesus and God. And the crown might represent her status as maybe queen of heaven, while her outstretched arms might represent her use of this status to help people on earth, kind of like an all-encompassing. Now, the European figures at the bottom are shown in a posture of prayer or even in th giving, you know, thanks. What might the artist have been trying to convey by showing them this um, position? How would you interpret maybe even the relative size of the European and Indian figures? Well, these are traditional postures for figures in Marian paintings. And may so merely be for artistic conventions, what everybody's always done. Or the postures may reflect um, Thanksgiving for the riches of Potosi in Bolivia, which had proven so crucial for the rise of Catholic Spain. And even the relative size may reflect the tradition of the painting and the highest status figures or the patrons of the painting dispro disproportionately large. And alternatively, you know, a stu you could interpret the sizes as a reflection of the oppressed or dominated state of the indigenous peoples, even including those indigenous elites. All right, visual source number four, making Christianity Chinese. What specifically Chinese elements can you identify in this image. Well, a lone tree and a scholar um, rock in the background were typical of Chinese landscape painting. Um, the house and furniture suggest the dwelling to be of a 
wealthy Chinese scholar. And the reading table in front of Mary was a common item in the homes of the Chinese literary elite. Even the clouds that appear at the angel's feet um, and around the shaft of light are associated with sacred Buddhist and Taoist figures. So who do you think, or to whom do you think, um, might this image have been directed? Well, the image may have been directed toward um, an elite Chinese audience who were, uh, or was literate and familiar with the Buddhist and Taoist ideas as well as Christianity. And how might the educated Chinese have responded to this? Well, many educated Chinese may have found the symbols and imagery familiar Right, making it easier to understand and interpret the print and its message. And it's also possible that an educated Chinese viewer might misinterpret the print as a Buddhist theme. And our last image, Visual Source 15. All right, the Christian art at the Mughal court. So why do you think that this Mughal painter portrayed Mary and Joseph as rather distinguished and educated persons rather than the humble carpenter and his peasant wife as in so many European images? You know, why might have the artist placed the family in rather palatial surroundings instead of a stable, for example? Well, the painting was for an elite audience, therefore the depiction of educated persons of a courtly status seemed appropriate. And the Mughal artists and, and patron were less concerned with getting the details of the Christian story correct and more concerned with the aesthetic impact of the painting. The Mughal emperors were less concerned with ensuring that um, all of the details of the Christian story were faithfully rendered than with creating an aesthetically pleasing composition. So the palatial surroundings were more familiar um, in a Mughal court painting. So how do you imagine European missionaries responded to this representation of the Holy Family? Well, some European missionaries might have viewed this painting as a positive development, as it reflected an interest in Jesus and Mary, and others might have responded more negatively, since the painting depicts the scene inaccurately. They might have, you know, believe it was a deliberate misrepresentation uh, of the story. But what about the Muslims? How might more Orthodox Muslims have reacted to the larger project of creating a blended religion, making use of elements from these different traditions? Well, the Wahhabis rejected all d deviation from what they viewed as a pure ver version of, uh, of the faith that prevailed during the early years of the religion. And they would have likely had a strong negative reaction to this image. And that sums up the Reflections and Visual Sources Commentary for Chapter 15.